Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses. As we continue with part 58, The Kabbalah and Magic, Book 8, The Kabbalah and Other Channels of Esoteric Tradition, by Arthur Edward Waite. Book 8, The Kabbalah and Other Channels of Esoteric Tradition. Argument. Modern occultism regards all the secret sciences as vehicles of the great occult tradition. But this is outside the purpose of the present inquiry, which is confined to estimating the extent of the influence exercised by Kabbalism on other branches of esoteric knowledge in the West. It is found that this influence has been much exaggerated in the West. It has been unquestionably large in the case of ceremonial magic, but very small in that of alchemy, of astrology, etc. Freemasonry has also been regarded by occultists as a channel of the secret tradition, but its connection with Kabbalism is slight. The claims of the tarot as a key of Kabbalistic symbolism are set aside without prejudice to their merits because of an insuperable difficulty. As a conclusion to the whole research, the doctrine of pure mysticism is contrasted with that of Kabbalism and the points reached in the investigation are brought into a single focus. 1. The Kabbalah and Magic it was established at the outset of our inquiry that occult speculations do not consider any single system as the exclusive depository of occult knowledge. A variety of channels are recognized and by the network of communications subsisting between these channels, the occult sciences are methodized and their identities and analogies exhibited. There is an enormous divergence of opinion as to what may and may not constitute a path of the secret tradition, individual predilection exercising, as will be supposed, no inconsiderable influence. We may conclude in a general manner that the tradition being ubiquitous by the hypothesis is thought to have assumed its forms everywhere and at all times. There was, for example, no exoteric religion which did not possess an esoteric interpretation, and there was no esoteric interpretation which did not connect that religion with all that is more especially understood here by the secret teaching. For this hypothesis, the integral connection of Kabbalism with other systems belonging to the far past would be evidence enough that it had its root in the secret tradition. But without denying altogether that there may be a certain warrant for a not dissimilar view, we have found that many of the resemblances may be accounted for in a more natural and spontaneous manner. As however it was in the Western world that Kabbalism was chiefly propagated and may be said roughly to have developed, it is necessary to observe its connections with other channels by which the arcane knowledge is believed to have been communicated to the West. These are magic, alchemy, astrology, the occult associations which culminated in Freemasonry and finally an obscure sheaf of hieroglyphs known as tarot cards. There's also a side question as to whether devotional mysticism, apart from any formal initiation, shows any trace of Kabbalism over and above that of unconscious analogy. Like the studies which have preceded it, the object of this concluding book is rather to correct misconceptions than to establish novel views. Far too much stress has been laid upon the common basis of all the occult sciences. While those who look for their enlightenment more especially to the Kabbalistic apparatus have been unduly predisposed to discern Kabbalism at the root of all. We shall see that in most instances the connection was accidental, a matter of adornment, late in its introduction or chiefly of the historical order. The paramount exception to this statement is the first system with which we have here to deal. There is no doubt that magic in the West owes its processes and its complexion to Kabbalism, though it would be folly to pretend that without Kabbalism there would have been no Western magic. I propose in the present section to restrict the use of the term magic within the narrow limits of its common acceptation. To take it in its higher sense as equivalent to divine wisdom would make it superfluous to inquire whether it connects with a tradition which lays claim to the same definition. The question as it is understood here is rather historical than metaphysical and is concerned only with the Western world. The white and black magic of the Middle Ages constitutes a kind of spurious practical Kabbalah which represents Jewish esoteric science debased to the purposes of the sorcerer. And it is necessary that we should estimate it at its true worth because it has been the subject of much misconception not only among uninstructed persons but even professed students. 
A study of the Zoharistic writings, their developments and commentaries, even with the slender materials which are offered in this work, will show that the ends proposed by the speculative Kabbalah are very different from the evocation of spirits, the raising of ghosts, the discovery of concealed treasures, the bewitchments and other mummeries of ceremonial magic. The Kabbalah does, however, countenance, as we have seen, the doctrine of the power resident in divine names, and it is, in fact, one of the burdens of its inheritance. Of the antiquity and diffusion of that doctrine, there can be no doubt. In one or other of its forms, it has obtained almost universally, and like all universal beliefs behind the insensate character which it exhibits externally, there may be an inward reason which accounts for it. Without attempting an inquiry in which we should be probably baffled, it is sufficient here to indicate that at the sources to which Kabbalistic tradition is generally referred, namely Arcadia, Chaldea and Babylonia, this doctrine prevailed. It was no doubt brought out of Babylon by the Jews and they carried it with them into the dispersion of the third exile. It inspired a whole cycle of bizarre legends concerning Solomon and his marvels more than this, it may be said to be directly connected with the Kabbalistic symbolism concerning the divine powers and qualities attaching to the Hebrew alphabet. The worlds were made, so to speak, by the instrument of a single letter, and four letters are the living forces which actuate them. There can be therefore no question that every Kabbalist accepted, symbolically at least, the doctrine of the power of words. It must have passed very early into your unfortunate applications, Sacred names were written on amulets and talismans which were used to heal diseases, to avert evil chances and so forth. But it was a part also of the Chaldean doctrine that the possessor of the divine name could in some obscure way influence the God to whom it was attributed. Above all the demons and evil spirits became subservient to the power of such words. Here is the germ of which the last development or rather the final corruption, is to be found in the French grimoires of black magic. It was, broadly speaking, somewhere about the 14th century that a Latin literature rose up in Europe, passing subsequently into the vernaculars of various countries, containing processes for compelling spirits by means of divine names which are corruptions of Hebrew terms. The processes pretend to be translated from the Hebrew, but, if so, the originals are not extant. The chief of them is known as the Key of Solomon, of which there are two recensions, more correctly regarded as distinct works under an identical title. Among the points which should be observed concerning them is the fact that while they are concerned with all classes of spirits, good and evil, for every variety of purpose, but mostly illicit, they contain no formula for dealing with the dead, and this, I think, indicates their Jewish origin for the Jews had very strong feelings as to the sacred nature of the repose of the human soul. Out of these two works, there was developed subsequently a larger variety of processes, more distinctly spurious, which did enter into necromantic mysteries. They begot also many variations adapted for the use of Christian operators, and containing sacred words, the efficacy of which would not have been so promptly acknowledged by a Hebrew. It is one thing to note the existence of this literature and to confess its derivation. It is another, and as I think an unfortunate policy, to exalt works like the Key of Solomon into embodiments of genuine Kabbalistic tradition. It is an insult to the rabbins of the Holy Synod to suggest their connection with the puerilities and imbecility of ceremonial magic. It has been done in England and is being done at this day in France. The professed Kabbalistic occultists of the latter country would actually seem to ascribe a superior importance and an additional aspect of mystery to the worthless clavicles of Solomon by representing that they are the only written memorials of a most secret oral branch of practical Kabbalism instead of the final debasement of a perfectly traceable, if not rationally accountable doctrine concerning divine names. Dr. Pappus observes, the practical part of the Kabbalah is barely indicated in a few manuscripts scattered through our great libraries. At Paris, the Bibliothèque Nationale possesses one of the finest exemplars, of which the origin is attributed to Solomon. These manuscripts, generally known under the name of clavicles, are the basis of all the old grimoires which circulate in country places. The Great and Little Albert, Red Dragon and Enchiridion. 
and of those which drive priests into mental alienation by sorcery, grimoire of Honorius. The statement does not exhibit full acquaintance with the works which it mentions. The Enchiridion in its earliest forms owes little to the keys of Solomon, and the grimoire of Honorius is not more concerned with sorcery than are rituals like the Red Dragon. Finally, the intellectual and moral difference between the clavicles and their derivatives is so slight that it is scarcely worth laboring. As regards their scope and intention, the clavicles are themselves grimoires. I have indicated the possibility that behind the ancient doctrine of the virtue resident in certain theurgic words and formulae there may be concealed a secret of the sanctuaries. So also the apparatus of ceremonial magic may be a travesty and disfigurement of an occult practice known also to the occult sanctuaries. But no one is on the track of these mysteries who begins by mistaking signum for signatum on the one hand, or the mutilated reflection for the original on the other. The general fact remains that it is by the perversion of the Kabbalah that we have obtained the grimoires, and that the sympathetic student of the Jewish tradition must tolerate this unwelcome fact as he best can. I should prefer to ignore altogether this so-called practical part of the Kabbalah, but so much importance having been attributed to it by modern occultists, it seems necessary for the sake of completeness to say something briefly of its materials and its method. It was concerned above all with the names of God, firstly, as they are found in Holy Scripture, and secondly, as their mysteries were developed by means of Kabbalistic processes. It attributed certain names to the Sephiroth, and these were regarded as analogous to the divine forces and attributes associated with the Sephiroth. The divine name connected with Kether was that signifying the essence of the deity, Ahia, A-H-I-H, that of Chokmah is Jod, Ja, or Tetragrammaton, commonly rendered Jehovah, J-H-V-H, and susceptible of 12 permutations similar to the sealing names of I-H-V in the Sefer Yetzirah. These permutations are called banners by the Kabbalists. The name Jehovah Elohim, J-H-V-H Alhim, is attributed to Bina and signifies God of Gods. El Al is referred to Chest, and its meaning, according to Rosenroth, is God of Grace and Ruler of Mercy. Geburah is in correspondence with Elohim Gibor, the strong god who avenges the crimes of the wicked. Eloah Vadath is the divine name of Tefereth, seen here. Jehovah, or Adonai Sabaoth, is seen here. The god or lord of hosts is connected with Netzach. Elohim Sabaoth, of similar meaning, belongs to Hod, Shaddai El Chai, seen here. The omnipotent living god is referable to Jesod, Adonai Melech, seen here, to Malkuth. But the ten Sephirot are naturally connected with the ten numbers, and hence there was an occult power resident in numerals analogous to that which was inherent in the Hebrew letters. The divine names belonging to the Sephirot were those also of the scale of the Denari, but over and above these there were other names referred to the numbers based on the number of the letters which gave expression to these names. Thus, the number one was represented by the single letter Jod, understood as a divine name and not in its alphabetical order in which it is equivalent to ten. The number two was represented by J-H and A-L. The number three by thus as seen here equals Shaddai. The number four by J-H-V-H and A-H-I-H, five by Alim, to which I presume that Christian Kabbalism has added thus as seen here equals Jehoshua or Jesus. Six by thus as seen here and thus, seven by thus and thus, eight by thus and thus, nine by thus and thus, ten by thus and by the extended tetragrammaton thus seen here. It may be added in this connection that according to Cornelius Agrippa, simple numbers were used to express divine things. Numbers of ten were for celestial, numbers of one hundred for earthly, and numbers of a thousand for things to come. The divine names and their qualifications were also tabulated in reference to the twenty-two letters. Of these names, the greatest power and virtue were attributed to the tetragrammaton, which was the root and foundation of all, and the ruling force of the world. Its true pronunciation, as already seen, was one of the secrets of the sanctuary, and for Kabbalistic magic was the master key of all successful operation. With this was connected the name of 72 letters obtained by the Kabbalistic computation of the numbers of the letters of tetragrammaton, after a conventional manner, as follows. Jod equals 10, Jod he equals 15, Jod he vow equals 21, Jod he vow he equals 26, together equaling 72, 
After the divine names come those of the orders of the angels and the chiefs of the hierarchy concerning which something has been said already in the section on Kabbalistic pneumatology. It would serve no purpose to enumerate all the complicated apparatus developed in this connection. The ten archangels and the ten angelic orders corresponded to the ten divine names connected with the Sephiroth and the name of 72 letters had 72 other angels attributed thereto whose names were extracted by a conventional device from Exodus 14, 19, 20 and 21. There were angels of the cardinal points, rulers of the four elements, angels of the planets, angels of the divine presence. And in opposition to all these, there were also evil spirits, princes of devils held to be offensive in the elements and so forth. This apparatus passed bodily over to the ceremonial magic of the Middle Ages, which the debased Kabbalah may be said to have constituted and ruled throughout. And it is for this reason that Western conventional magic has so little connection with folklore. Thank you for watching and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Roses. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.